Hi, I'm Alethea Power, um, and I am pretty new to the field of deep learning. I've been in it for about five months now through the course of the Scholars Program. Um, I'm getting a warning that I have bad network quality, so if, if I'm not coming through clearly, somebody let me know in the background. Um, so anyway, uh, about uh, at the end of last year, I, I oh, sorry, distracted by the network quality. Uh, my background is in software engineering and site reliability engineering, and I've always been interested in AI, but at the end of last year, I decided to try and make the switch to a new career. Um, and so to that end, I applied to the, uh, to the scholars program, and I was incredibly grateful to be able to get in, and it's been an amazing start to a new career. Um, I want to thank OpenAI. I particularly want to thank uh, my mentor and the other mentors who've been helpful and the other scholars. It's been a fantastic cohort to go through all of this with. Um, so during the course of the program, I got very interested in uh, interpretability. Interpretability is basically mind reading for AI. Um, it's about tearing open neural networks and looking at how they represent and process information. Um, and it's difficult to do um, because uh, AI and deep learning in particular is, is very different from traditional software engineering. So there's a picture that almost everyone in the field has seen, uh, software engineering, a human being writes some software, the software takes inputs and gives outputs. They could be questions and answers like a search engine or you know whatever. Um, but in deep learning, a human being creates math and gives it some data to train on, and that's what writes the software that takes inputs and outputs. And it turns out that software written by math and by a computer is much harder to understand than software written by a human being. Um, but it really matters because AI is everywhere. It impacts us in tremendous ways throughout our lives. So I'm a transgender person, and that means that for a lot of my life, my body is a different shape than cisgender people's bodies. And that means that scanners at airports usually flag me for needing a pat down. It's humiliating, it's embarrassing, it's not the end of the world, um, but it, it's not cool. And AI impacts other people in worse ways. Um, there are systems that, that you know, self-driving cars are more likely to hit people of color and, you know, there's all sorts of biases and injustices that can come in. So if we understand how these systems work, then we can reduce their bias. In addition to that, if we understand how they work, then we can improve their efficiency. We can find smaller networks that do the same sort of job and take a lot less electricity, a lot less time, a lot less resources, and a lot less money. And finally, if we understand how neural networks thought, uh, how neural networks represent information, then we have a better chance of actually being able to understand human thought, which to me is the most interesting question of all. So I decided to uh, dig into interpretability by analyzing GPT-2. Um, this was a state-of-the-art language generation, language modeling network that OpenAI released about a year and a half ago. Um, and the way this network works is you give it some input, uh, some text, and it generates output. So this is an actual example. I fed the, the phrase, my talk is about, into GPT-2, and it said the future of education. You can give it um, the beginning of a sentence and get the end. You can give it a paragraph and get an essay. Um, it's very good at generating text, and a lot of what it generates is indistinguishable from human beings. This is pretty powerful and pretty dangerous. Um, I know you can do something like train GPT-2 on you know, some sort of uh, subreddit and, and get it to generate political text. And then you could use it to look like uh, there's a bunch of people on the internet who all have the same idea and it's really just software. And that's pretty dangerous. So we need to understand it. We need to dig into it and know how it works and how to combat things that are generated by it and how to make sure that it's used in safe ways. Um, so I had a certain amount of uh, time to do this project and I decided I would bite off a tractable part of this problem. The first thing I would do is just try and understand how GPT-2 understands English grammar. Um, so to explain how I figured that out, I need to give a little bit of background on how GPT-2 works. Some of the people on this call will know all about this and are literally world experts. I think uh, the lead author on the GPT-2 paper is on this call. Um, also, my mom is on this call. Hi, mom. Uh, so I want to make sure and, and give some background that's applicable to a wide variety of audiences 
um, and try not to leave anybody behind uh, based on a lack of, of already having you know, a full knowledge of how this works. I also think that's a core part of interpretability, trying to make sure to democratize this information and spread it around so that uh, people outside the field can actually have an understanding of what's going on. So I'm gonna spend a second talking about transformer architecture and then I'll get into what I built on top of it. Uh, GPT-2 is a transformer, but I'll get into that in a minute. So when I feed this beginning of the sentence in, my talk is about the first thing it does is split that uh, split that string into tokens. Tokens can be words, they could be punctuation marks, they could be um, collections of, of bytes in this string, they could be um, uh, yeah, just basically subparts of the string. I restricted myself to sentences that had tokens, uh, had a one-to-one -one mapping between the tokens and the sentences and punctuation marks, because that made it a little bit easier for me to analyze. Um, GPT-2 has a little bit of a subtle way of doing this, um, but I, I kind of circumvented it. Um, these tokens, oops, oops, I'm clicking the wrong button here. Uh, these tokens get converted into vectors, and uh, the word my always converts into this vector here. And this is actually talk with a space in front of it. That always converts into this vector. So I end up with these four vectors that, excuse me, that get fed into GPT-2 and they flow through the network along these positions. So if I put four tokens in, I get four tokens out. Um, in this particular diagram, there's, there's four positions flowing through it. Um, <clears throat> so what are they flowing through? The first part here is an embedding layer. That's what turns them into vectors. Then it has a bunch of decoder blocks. Uh, GPT-2 comes in a variety of sizes. I looked at GPT-2 small, which is what would fit on my home graphics card, and even it is huge. It has over 100 million parameters, which variables, um, and so I knew that I needed to try and break it up to, to tackle this problem. Um, and most of these parameters are here in these decoder blocks. And finally, it has a language modeling layer. So each decoder block takes in vectors in each position and outputs vectors in each position. And then this language modeling layer takes the final set of vectors that come out of the top decoder block and produces probabilities for what the next word might be. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, inside of these decoder blocks are what are called attention heads. Now, attention heads mix and match information between the different positions to feed out into the new positions. So they kind of like collect the information that's spread across the input and collect it into focused areas. So you can kind of think of this as, um, as being like, if you've ever been to a sushi boat restaurant that has you know, the little stream with the little boat that floats along next to your table with pieces of sushi on it. So you can imagine each of these positions flowing through the network being like a sushi boat path and the tokens, the vectors going through there are like sushi boats. And an attention head might look at all of these positions and take all the cucumber out of all the sushi and put it into only the one in position one. And well, actually it wouldn't do that. Only the one in, in the last position. Um, attention heads in GPT-2 are not allowed to take information from future tokens and feed it into past positions. Um, the information can only flow this way and up, it can't flow this way. Um, so anyway, you can imagine these attention heads kind of mixing and matching little bits of the sushi together and feeding them forward, trying to get a more organized picture of what's going on for the task it's trying to perform. Um, each of these layers, each of these uh, decoder or blocks here has 12 attention heads and they can all operate independently. And then at the top of each layer, uh, there's a linear layer that uh, puts all their outputs together and organizes them into output for that whole layer. Okay, that's a whirlwind tour of transformer architecture. Um, so what is GPT-2 actually doing? So it's supposed to, in each position, the goal is for it to output the next word. And like I said, this top language modeling layer outputs probabilities. And so ideally you want the word talk to have a higher probability than others. And here you want the word is to have a higher probability because the next word here was talk. So you want that to generate talk. The next word here is is, so you want that to generate is. Okay, um, and so it goes through this. It does it all the way to the end. And here 
it's going to generate some word that, uh, that you haven't had in your input, which you can then feed back in and generate future words. So this is how GPT-2 uh, comes up with a completion of the sentence or a paragraph or you know, whatever. This is called autoregression. Um, so, um, okay. So uh, what I did here, in order to understand how grammar is understood inside the network, I stripped off this language modeling linear layer and replaced it with a grammar, oops, with a grammar modeling layer. Um, so what this means is instead of having an output probabilities of English words or byte pair encodings of English words, which is how GPT-2 tokenizes, I had it output probabilities of parts of speech. Um, and I looked at three different kinds of grammar, simple part of speech, detailed part of speech, and uh, syntactic dependencies. Um, so simple part of speech is like um, pronoun, verb, et cetera, et cetera. Detailed part of speech is like object of the preposition. And syntactic dependencies is, I'm sorry, object of the preposition is syntactic dependencies. And detailed part of speech is just more fine grain. You know, what, what is each word doing in there? Um, so anyway. Anyway, I put this grammar modeling layer on the top of this and I trained it. I built three data sets, one for each of these different types of grammatical structures, huge data sets, uh, 300,000 sentences, and I used uh, Spacey, which is a natural language processing tool out in the wild, to tag all these sentences with their grammatical structures. Please note here, the goal of this project was not to produce a grammatical tagger because Spacey already does that and does that better than the thing I built. My goal here was to use a grammatical tagger on top of GPT-2 as a way of measuring information inside of GPT-2. Um, so you can see here, this shows it outputs parts of speech. Um, I also looked at, once I had this grammatical tagger in place, I looked at uh, what are called entropy, what, what are, I'm not going to explain the technical details of this. I'm short on time here. Um, the gist is I looked at the entropies of the attention matrices uh, coming out of the attention heads for sentences in each of these, of each of these different structures. Um, and the entropy of an attention matrix, basically what it does is it tells you how complicated the mixing and matching that that layer, that that head is doing. So if all the head is doing is taking all of the cucumber out of all the sushis and putting it in position one, that's a relatively low entropy operation. It's not that complicated. But if the head is mixing and matching a whole bunch of things in complicated ways, then the entropy will be higher. Um, so these are pictures of the attention uh, matrix entropies. Um, and this is organized, these are attention heads, and this is layer one of the network, layer two of the network. The diagram I had before only showed three layers, but GPT-2 small has uh, 12 layers high. Um, hmm. I've shown you the wrong one and given away a little bit of the future. I was supposed to show you one with 12 layers here instead of 11. Ignore the man behind the curtain, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, what's interesting here though to note is that the entropies are much higher at lower layers of the network. And so what that tells us is that the network is doing a lot more uh, restructuring and looking at the relationships between words in these first four layers for this grammatical task than in the upper layers. Interesting. So maybe grammatical comprehension lives at uh, lower layers of the network. So to test that, I took my grammatical classifier and I ran it on top of each layer of GPT-2 and looked at how hard it was to train um, and how good of a score it could get, basically how low the loss was. Um, and I've got a video here of what that looked like. Um, so, so you can see you can see here layer zero means I ran it right on top of the embedding before any of the layers of GPT-2 ran. Uh, I trained it for up to 200 epochs. I actually trained it longer, but I cut the graph off at 200. It kept going another like 250 or so, and it did not learn a ton. Um, and this particular one was for syntactic dependencies. You can see at layer one, it did a bit better. At layer two, it did yet better still. And at layer four, it did pretty great. Layer five, it did excellent. Um, and so, 
this shows how well uh, this grammar classifier trained on top of each of these layers of the network. So this is really interesting. It did a much better job at layers five and six, and you can see it actually got its best score on layer five. It did the very best, it did a much better job at layers five and six than at the layers before and that at the layers after. So it means that this information came into view through these attention head, heads manipulating it in these first four layers, the grammatical information did, and then it started to go back out of view. So this led me to the question of, is it because the later half of the network is trying to generate future words that that's what it was trained to do? And so that's why uh, it, maybe it's more focused on the future than it is on the past. So I, uh, whoops. Um, uh, actually, yeah. Um, so I trained it for uh, syntactic tagging of what the expected output token should be instead of just the input tokens. And you can see that it peaked out up here at layer eight. So if we just look, this is incoming and that's outgoing, incoming and outgoing. So this grammar classifier basically is, uh, it's like a, a tool to measure where the information lives in the network and how much information is easily accessible for this grammatical task at different layers. Um, and you can see that the information for understanding the grammar of the incoming sentence or incoming tokens is much better at lower layers and for outgoing, it's much better at higher layers. Cool. So what we're actually seeing here, and sorry, I've got my slides out of order and I've given away another thing I'm gonna say. What we're seeing here is that is that these heads are rotating this information into view of these positions in a kind of abstract informational space. And here's an example of what I mean by that. I laid a bunch of markers on a table and looking at them from this angle, you can't tell how many markers are there because you're looking at the wrong angle. So if I rotate them slightly, you can tell there's more than one, but not really how many or what colors they are. If I rotate them a bit further, you can tell there's a few, but it's not clear how many greens there are. And if I rotate them yet further, you can see exactly how many markers there are and exactly what colors they are. So this is what I mean by rotating information. This is kind of an abstract version of the same thing. The grammatical information is being rotated and not just rotated, but stretched and compressed and warped and other types of things so that it comes into view of these positions that are flying through the network. Um, I also did the same thing for simple part of speech and detailed part of speech. And you can see those both coalesce in layer three, which makes sense. Those are simpler to figure out. So once I had this, I took my grammar classifier and I chopped off the top half of GPT-2 and just ran it on top of layer five. And in here, I decided to look at how important each head each attention head in the remaining network was for this classification. And I tried a couple of strategies. The first strategy, I followed a paper uh, called Our 16 Heads Better Than One, where I, and I'm not even gonna bother and try and make this interpretable to, uh, to non-technical people. I fed in a mask tensor, uh, a ones tensor, and I multiplied that by the output of each attention head and then took uh, did back propagation to find the Jacobian of the grammatical classification loss with respect to the coefficient of each head. And that would give me some at least locally linear interpretation of how important that head was for grammatical classification. Um, but it turned out that strategy didn't actually work that well. Um, it had worked pretty well in the paper for BERT, but it didn't work that well for GPT-2. So instead I tried a slower, more computationally intensive strategy where I just uh, chopped out each head individually and looked at its impact to the grammatical classification. So if it had a big impact, then that attention head mattered and that was a place where grammar was being learned. Um, and using that, I was able to pull out a lot of the heads in here. So for this particular grammatical structure, the very best loss I could get was cutting out almost every head in the network. So the black here is where I removed a head and the white are the heads remaining. Um, this grammatical structure needed a bit more, a few more heads. This one needed almost no heads. In fact, it didn't need heads at all in some of these layers, which is kind of amazing. Um, and so anyway, uh, 
uh, in the future, I would like to look at, I would like to take these maps of heads that matter for different grammatical structures and dig into them and figure out what's going on in these individual heads now that I've reduced GPT-2 to a much smaller collection of subnetworks that are practical to analyze. And I'd like to compare and contrast how these uh, maps relate between structures. Like here you can see these three heads are not needed for this structure or that structure or this structure. So there's relationships in here. And I think we can find uh, sub networks of GPT-2 that relate to different grammatical structures. Um, and hopefully that will one day down the road get us to the point where we can better tear open these language models and have a much deeper understanding of what's going on in them. Okay, um, hopefully I'm under my time. Um, anyway, time for Q&A. I know we're all running a little bit long, so I don't know if there's time for Q&A, but we'll see. Um, anybody got questions? I'm looking over here because I have a separate monitor with a Q&A. Oh, here we go. Um, from papers like the image GPT, we know that transformers have great representations in the middle of the network. In how far is the grammar loss predictive of useful representations for other tasks and not just grammar detection? That's a great question. Um, I haven't read the image GPT, GPT paper. Um, like I said, I have been in the field of deep learning for about five months um, during a pandemic and a revolution, and I also had a bunch of medical problems. Um, so I don't actually know the results of this paper, but it sounds cool. I would love to read it. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, how is the grammar loss predictive of useful representations for other tasks and not just grammar detection? I think it's probably generalizes pretty well. Um, it's going to, you're going to need to have some way of classifying what it is that you're looking for. So in this particular way, in this particular case, I had a good easy way to generate a large data set that I could tag with grammatical structures. So I was able to measure a particular, like I had a good concrete understanding and good concrete mechanism for measuring information presence. Um, I think for situations where you can easily or plausibly produce a data set that actually, uh, and, and train a classifier that actually measures the kind of information you're looking for, then this is pretty generalizable. Um, for other things, more abstract type uh, questions, it's gonna be a lot harder. Um, yeah, it's all about math. And if you, if you can't find a good way to numerically measure it, it's gonna be hard to do. Um, some things you can just brute force visualize, but, um, but I don't have the compute power to do that yet. Hopefully I will in the not too distant future. Okay, do you think the number of heads that are needed are correlated with the complexity of the sentence structure or did you notice any specific repeated patterns? You know, I was actually really surprised that some sentence structures needed so few heads um, and it makes me want to dig into how much information is in these linear sublayers of the transformer blocks uh, because clearly they're doing something um, like, like you saw before, some of these layers didn't need any heads at all, which is kind of shocking. Um, I do think there's, there's clearly a correlation between the complexity of the network that's needed and the complexity of the sentence structure that's coming in. I don't know that it's a perfect correlation and I haven't gone and, uh, done a calculation like, for instance, um, I, I would like to do some analysis like, um, a way of measuring the complexity of a sentence and compare that directly to the number of heads and, and give a mathematical answer to this question. I haven't done that yet, but just visually, it does look like there's some correlation there. Um, and it does look like sentences that have similar structures to one another have similarities in the heads that are important, which is a validation that this strategy makes some sense. Um, yeah, okay. Any other questions? All right, I think that might be it for questions.